<laughs> you never know when you present on like panels that you're gonna be eye level with people. You know? Like sometimes you're like really low, like you're like in the bottom of like a pit. So or true. you're like so high up looking down like Either you, it's really good. talking about equitability so it's kind of <laughs> That's that. That's like our mic for the report. Zoom. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> I think we are going to start. Um. Uh, my name is Atahun Kobede. Uh, oh. Okay. Cool. Um. Yeah. Go on. I would say originally this music. It's this one. Yeah. No fear. I don't like my music. Yes, fix it. Oh. Oh. Um. So I came in, you know, the, the U.S. at about like 18, 19 years, came, you know, lived in Spokane for eight years. And I wanted to know how many of you were born in Spokane. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure the rest of us are, you know, we made Spokane our home. And when I got this job at Eastern Washington, I was pretty happy. I was, this is going to be an amazing place uh, for me to be because I grew up in Ethiopian, you know, rural farm, farm, the wheat fields looked like my you know my home and you know I made it home I'm still here and um and you know the longer I lived when I started living here the things that I really experienced it, uh those unpleasant as much as you know sometimes we only remember you know the bad things you know um but there are great things but there are also stuff that I never expected to experience on a liberal um campus campus that supposedly to be like very inclusive and i talk to people of color people who, of a different uh cultural background what their experiences are and they tell me oh wow well, yeah that i encountered you know statements that are really uh not good <laughs> I mean, it that way. and when um last year i applied for this chertok professorship and by the way, Chertok was a friend of my friend, uh, Fred, Dr. Fred Strange. He's, you know, he's here. Um, and I wanted to really create a dialogue about um, what I started to call um, white liberal supremacy. That's the only supremacy that I, you know, I, I know. And I was looking for literature, materials, resources. Who might have done some kind of research on this topic, and um, naturally I come across uh, Dr. Beeman. I wanted to really introduce her. You know, I'm just by you know using this as you know um, a gateway, and I found her work, and it really resonated uh, with me in terms of you know the way she engaged this topic. Um, Dr. Beeman is a really an outstanding scholar. Um, you know, who is a public sociologist. She's a distinguished researcher and an academic uh, who really fearlessly examined these issues. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't make you a popular, but, <laughs> you know, when you talk about this kind of issue on a pretty much liberal environment, it wouldn't make you like, whoa, let me give you a huh? hug. You're going to really be uh, promoted. Um, <laughs> but it's an applied research. She sheds light on how organizations, I looked at her bio and how 
organizations come poster. This is not a critique, it's not personal. It's how to make this place more welcoming, more engaging, uh, because sometimes it hurts when people say stuff like, for example, like, um, white trash. And I say, oh, no, when you say white trash, you know what, I read the reverse. What do you really think about me when you say, when you categorically call a certain group of people trash? I, it worries me, you know? I, I don't know. This is how, I, you know, I feel it shouldn't be, like, you know? I feel for others as much as I feel for myself. And I came across liberal white supremacy, how progressive silence, racial and class oppression by, by Dr. Bima. And her publications have really featured in prestigious public in a journal. Harvard Business Review, Sociological Forum. She really received awards from American Sociological Association. So everyone, you know, and she really continues to discourse on racial and class oppression. And um, she, you know, she's very instrumental in reshaping our understanding of these critical issues. That racism is no one has a monopoly over racism. You know, it's not certain group of people who are racist. Uh, it, it, you know, it pervades, it, you know, it, it, it's all over the place, you know. So Dr. Beeman's influence extends, in my, you know, from a record far beyond academia. You know, she has shared her expertise with various audiences, organizations, and, you know, advocating for social justice and inclusivity, which I really ad admire and appreciate. And her work has earned recognition from institutions such as Stanford University, UC Berkeley, NASA, to just mention a few. Um, in addition to her scholarly pursuit, uh, Professor Biran has organized panels and workshops like this on researching and teaching racism, furthering the dialogue on this crucial uh, topic that we're, it's gonna not, I hate to say this, may not get better. Uh, so we have to brace ourselves. Her, you know, <laughs> education to address these social problems and <laughs> think scholarly activism is evident in her numerous media appearances and achievements. She speaks not only for a particular group of people, for all people who are marginalized, you know, based on their class, based on their color, based on their immigration background, their religion, and so forth. We are blessed to have her here. Um, you know, to be honest, and Professor Bima earned her PhD from the University of Connecticut and her dissertation on grassroots organizing and post-civil rights racism received acclaim from one of the most prestigious institutions, the Society for the Study of Social Problems. And she is an athlete faculty member with Black and Latino Studies at Baruch College. Yeah, that, I, I, know, I always have trouble, you know, pronouncing the name. So Dr. Bima's work is really timely. You know, there are a lot of rhetoric that comes from different group of people about immigrants and people of color, and we need to have this dialogue. Uh, and I, I'm really happy, I'm, you know, to have her here, and I welcome her to re share her uh, research, her experience with us. And thank you, Dr. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, the, for, that introduction is just it's so generous, and it's it's so nice to hear. Uh, you know, like when someone else summarizes your work, <laughs> like you're like, yes, yeah, yeah. that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Yeah. I, like, it, it really, really makes me feel seen. As you know, this kind of work it can um, result in backlash and and retaliation. So it, it feels so nice to 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 hear that and and understand that people see value in it. Um, so I really appreciate you and in inviting me and inviting me to do the church talk lecture and Guyan setting introducing me to these wonderful community activists. I mean, I just, I truly feel so honored, like hearing more about your work, reading about your work. I mean, people who've been working in the community and have been doing the work for a long time. And I know that it's it's often thankless, <laughs> right? And, and and you're not always receiving that recognition or support that you deserve. Um, and I, did we go through the introduction? Yeah. So, um, so I am also a physiology professor at Eastern Washington University. Uh, when my colleague um, Dr. Kibli told me about um, Dr. Beeman's visit, I basically interjected myself <laughs> <laughs> and say, "Hey, this is perfect." And because I was aware of the conversation um, that has been going on 
you know, Southern community um, that were just so close to what Dr. Beeman described uh, in her book. So I decided that, you know, like, let's bring in a community panel uh, because I want to make the work that she's done uh, very relevant to our own community. So we can work on um, our progressive community um, to, to deal with this problems that we have seen has gone. Um, so kind of like symbolically, I'm, I am sitting in between our community panelists and our um, guest scholars here. Um, so kind of my role is bridging that conversation, tying what Dr. Beeman talked about with uh, what these panelists have experienced. And so I will just let them introduce themselves. Um, hi, my name is Justice for All. I uh, work for Spokane Community Against Racism. I've also the chair of the Justice Not Jail Pact. Um, I've been a long time activist in the community, working on several different projects that some successful, some not, but all of them pretty radical and very proud of. I'm practicing non absolutist, uh, meaning that, you know, when we talk about things like calling, you know, large groups of people um, racial names, that maybe that's you know, practical. Um, and uh, I'm a uh, non-binary, a uh, trans non-binary person, or you say them pronouns. Um, I'm multiracial. And uh, yeah, I love being a part of this community. I know it's uh, a harder community and a different community to fight for. It's hard to get the people out of their comfort zones, especially not understanding a lot of the racial elements that, that do impact a lot of people who come to Spokane and maybe transplant them maybe locals, but I try to bridge this gap by having I think there's more and more questions that we need to discuss here. And uh, I'm involved in the health of the industry. And one of the things is race on the farm, in the school, and in the direction of the <laughs> Um, so, uh, my pronunciation is her, um, a white white girl, as well as the Well, some works on many things that some of works, some of not, <laughs> so, yeah, work. It's also part of the Justice Not Show. And I um, started working at CSP about a little bit over a year ago. I uh, consider myself an activist, but I guess I am. Um, I just, yeah, I'm hearing about the book really resonated with me. Experiencing these things throughout various communities I've been in, um, especially in you know, our something we do over here. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, we are going to start with a uh, presentation from um, Dr. Beeman so that you have some context about what she wrote about in the book and then. Um, what we're going to do afterwards, then we will have a kind of discussion, kind of reading in some of the concepts that Dr. Dean uh, wrote about uh, in the conversation. So, Dr. Dean. Sure. And, th and thank you all for coming out, for being here to, to listen to this panel. Um, so I, I've chosen some passages to read to you from my book that just to give you an introduction to some of the, the concepts and, and the ideas. And the first passage that I'm going to share. Um, it gives, goes over some of my own experiences and the reasons for why I wrote this book. So um, partly why I wrote this book is because throughout my career, I've been engaging with, um, with in progressive circles, whether it was my professional organizations within academia and some of the communities um, and community organizations, the, the professional organizations that I serve, um, the journals that I, I serve, all of those communities are considered the more leftist leaning um, progressive groups. And in those spaces, there was always a kind of tension that I sensed between those 
those who really saw themselves as more progressive liberal and those who saw themselves as more um, progressive radical. And so I wanted to outline some of what I saw as what the fun, the key differences were and what those tensions were about. Um, but I also had a lot of personal experiences Good with. Is it okay? Okay. Um, so, personal experiences. Oh, it's okay. All right. Um, yeah, no problem. So, so experiences with racism, but also experiences with class elitism um, in my communities and in my formal organization. So. I'll read um, the first passage I wanted to share, which is from the the acknowledgments, which as I said before, is really like a foreword to the book and that's what I should have called it. <laughs> um, but I state, in my community, I dealt with both racist and classist bullying that took the form of physical and verbal attacks. And this included being called a quote, Chinese chink, even though I was Korean. One of the ways that I learned to deal with racist attacks against me at a very young age was by engaging in stoic silence. I recall several instances where my racist attackers were impressed with my ability to stand still and absorb their punches without reaction. As early as kindergarten, I endured both physical and verbal abuse from children who would punch me, kick me, call me names, while others insisted, what are you? My ethnicity was such a concern that my teacher once asked the class what I should mark as my ethnicity on the California achievement test. That's the standardized testing we took every year. When my, I told my parents about these instances, they responded, just tell them you're a human being. My father, who was European American, didn't know how to advise me on this racist bullying since he's never really encountered it on the same level. My mother, growing up in Korea, um, immigrated into the United States in her 20s. So she didn't, she wasn't subjected to those kinds of questions at, when she was a child. She was also struggling to navigate her own experiences with everyday racism in the United States, her trauma, her internalized oppression. So colorblind humanism was the only suggestion that they could provide. At the same time that my parents advised me to dismiss the racism I was facing, you know, as parents, I even heard myself, just ignore it, just ignore it, you know. It's hard, and I know that. Um, while they told me that, I also heard their anger against racist and classist behavior. I watched my mother fight against people who wronged her, despite the stereotype of Asian Americans as quiet, humble, and accommodating people. My mother was rarely silent against racist aggression and constantly argued with people who dismissed her, whether it be a store clerk, coworker, or friend. My father, who did not talk much about racism, clearly took a stand when he finally cut off contact with his mother, father, and other family members who disrespected his family, his children, his wife. Just as my mother was marked by her appearance and accent, my father was marked in a different way by his. Throughout my life, I've encountered classist behavior toward working class and Appalachian people who do not conform to European American middle class standards of perfect grammar and speech. My daughter is often noted that when I visit my hometown, she hears my accent come out and realizes that I must have tried to unlearn it. Sounding intelligent is a classist attitude that both European Americans and people of color can adopt and use to silence and disregard working class people. My father regularly used the word haint instead of the more commonly used ain't or the more acceptable is not, are not, or am not. But he was more intelligent than many of the people I met in academia. His feedback on some of my written work was as good or better than what I received from people with advanced degrees. However, he refused to have proper language forced upon him and never dismissed people who had less money or less formal education than he did. The politics of respectability and civility making an extra effort to dress nicely or to speak and behave in a dignified manner so as to gain acceptance into middle-class white, white society are both racialized and class, as Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham discusses in Righteous Discontent. In either form, respectability politics are used to silence people who have something to say about inequality. I hope this book will offer insight into these manifestations of racism and class elitism, not only so that we can better understand these divides, in politics and organizing, but also to recognize the experiences people of color and all working class people face in their everyday lives. So as a child, I learned how to use 
silence as a survival strategy. Um, and especially with in dealing with those like, attacks, that that was one of the ways that I dealt with them, um, one of the key ways. And my desire to break those silences on racism is partly what drew me to Malcolm X in some of his words, some of his ideas on liberals and conservatives, and also to Yuri Kochiyama, who's an Asian American activist, a civil rights activist, also a Black Panther, who a black was in the Black Power movement and very good friends with Malcolm X, and how she they both tried to bridge those divides together. Um, and, and a lot of some of her own trauma, I think, that she dealt with through silence, through parts of her life. But with Malcolm X, he made this distinction between liberals and conservatives. And he said that both liberals and conservatives want power. But he, based on his experiences, what he encountered, it seemed to him that white liberals were better at posing. He says that they were they would they're good at posing as to as being friends to African Americans. And then he compared white conservatives to wolves. He said, you know, it's not that I I had great experiences with white conservatives either, but they're like wolves. They show their teeth in a snarl that always lets him know where he stands, exactly where he stands. But with white liberals, he said he compared them to foxes, that there's they're sly like foxes, that that he doesn't know where he stands exactly, and that it doesn't matter who he or other African-Americans place their trust in, whether it's conservatives or liberals, because they will always end up in the dog doghouse, never in the White House. Um, so on May 19th, 2016, that was the 91st anniversary of Malcolm X's birthday. And I shared his words. I shared the longer quote. He has a, a long quote where he's comparing liberals and conservatives. So I shared that on social media. And in my book, I talk about doing that in, in the reaction um, that, that happened towards that. So I state the post elicited some backlash from white liberals who were offended by Malcolm's comparison of them to animals. When Johnny Eric Williams, a respective scholar on racism who had been targeted for his views on white supremacy, shared my post of Malcolm's quote, a European American liberal begged, quote, gentle friends, I hope that you view me as a person, not as a fox, wolf, donkey, or elephant, end quote. On the surface, this post calls for humanism, but it does so in a colorblind, non-humanistic way that dismisses the importance of what Malcolm X had to say about racism among liberals. This reaction is a defensive one, and it is indicative of a larger inability among liberals to be self-critical. What Malcolm X was expressing is still a fact of life for many people of color dealing with well-meaning liberals. In fact, one of the respondents in my case study of a racism evasive um, organization made this distinction when addressing Southern and Northern racism. She stated, don't grin in my face and act like you like me, but you're prejudiced. You really don't care for black people. She characterized people in the Northeast as being behind the closet in their racism. Dealing with this subtle racism at work was what ultimately wore her down and informed her decision to retire. When people of color deal with this form of racism, we have to exert greater emotional energy in reading and managing our emotions, as well as the emotions of the people directing these so-called microaggressions at us. Liberals have a hard time accepting that they are part of the racism that Malcolm X laid out. So I don't profess to have all the answers. These are things that I still struggle with in my work. And when I've attempted to address this, these issues in, in my work and, and in academic organizations, in academia that is supposed to be so open, so liberal, right, um, so progressive, I face retaliation as a result of some of that work. So um, for those of us who, who persist in this work, I think radical solidarity and, and thinking around how we can support each other is really necessary. And so uh, with that, I wanted to leave you with one last passage, if you'll indulge me, but it's it's where I talk about the need for this solidarity and the need for rainbow warriors. So it is a passage um, from this, this section called A Crucial Need for Rainbow Warriors. And there I state, focusing on white allyship is important, but it also bears the risk of recentering whiteness and white dominance. It is crucial to build alliances between people of color. In 1998, Elizabeth Martinez wrote on the need for rainbow warriors. She argued that when Vincent Chin was beaten to death by a European-American man who thought he was Japanese, 
all people of color should have protested, not just people of Asian descent. The same can be said about the movement for black lives. All people of color must be united against anti-blackness. In 2016, Asian American coalitions issued a statement against police violence in the Asian American officer, Peter Leong, who shot Akai Gurley, an African American man. These and other organizations such as Asian Americans for Black Lives and activ activists such as Grace Lee Boggs and Yuri Kochiyama, who were highly respected activists in the civil rights and Black Panther movements, set examples for rainbow warriors. White supremacy has impeded these alliances for centuries. Radical scholars of color allying together may be frightening to European American liberals and conservatives. Such alliances have the potential to challenge the capitalistic bedrock on which many institutions are founded and that support the careers of both liberals and conservatives. Perhaps this is why the Federal Bureau of Investigation took note of Du Bois' travels to Asia and feared that he wanted to unite the yellow and black races in opposition to the white race. People of color must struggle to create and maintain these alliances and European American allies must resist the urge to interfere with, interrupt and retaliate against them. This retaliation takes many forms. When I developed a faculty of color affinity group, group with black faculty, white faculty reacted with anger and verbal attacks and by spreading harmful rumors about members of the group. It was clear to us that we had disrupted the space that European American faculty felt belonged to them. Our meetings would often be interrupted by a knock on the door with some excuse of needing to share something with us. One European American faculty member accused us of racial hostility, even though she claimed to support the need for faculty of color to have this organizational space in the first place. These reactions and accusations towards affinity groups, caucuses, and cultural centers meant to provide a safe space for people of color have been documented in research on the transparency phenomenon in predominantly white institutions. Genuine allyship from European Americans allows space for people of color to organize without interruption and without viewing such alliances as racist attacks on them. People of color have experienced centuries of internalized racism, violence and trauma that we must deal with together. We have our own divisions to address. And we must be given the same voice and space as European American allies. So I look forward to hearing uh, more from the panelists and about how we can support each other in this work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so a lot we get a lot of requests to zoom this conversation and so we kind of catch up the technology last minute. So sorry about the technology um interruption, but this is because of that. Um so I will start with um my first question to our panelists and again Dr. Beeman, feel free to chime in in this discussion. Uh one of the themes in Dr. Beeman's book is about the behaviors of white allies who engage in anti-racism work with the main purpose of making themselves known as a good white person and to distinguish themselves from those other white folks who are racist. Uh, from your experiences, uh, why is it problematic and how can these behaviors do damage to BIPOC people um, and to anti-racism work? Um, Justice, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so I know we're coming at this in different kind of lengths and perspectives, but I think the first thing I want to address is um, for white people, I will also address your harms um, when it comes down to to having those blind spots or or feeling like you, you deserve the accolade without actually doing the work. Um, the hardest thing about being a person is our unknown unknowns, right? Mm -hmm. The things we can't actually get to. And so when we get the accolades, when we we get the achievement without the actual understanding of, of the, the struggle or what people go through, you are kind of cutting yourself off early. A lot of times when I talk to people, they're looking for validation in their answers based off what I'm saying. They're not listening to me. They're looking for, here are the key points. I related to you on this, look how woke I am, but all these other things, you're a crazy radical. And that kind of labeling, of course, is not something I agree with, but um, it's what we see a lot. Um, when it comes down to how does this impact BIPOC people, 
it's it's taking up a lot of space, right? Or or getting accreditation for things that you may have not have done. Um, it doesn't uplift those people who have been doing the work. And often you see BIPOC people in the community not getting the credit they deserve, regardless of how much effort they may have put into something. Um, you see the other harms of uh, BIPOC people, you know, kind of feeling defeated, right? You see that there are people getting these accolades that are, are considered the good ones. But, you know, as a BIPOC person, to be considered the good one, you know how many more steps I have to climb up? You know how much harder I have to fight? You know how much more I need to change the tone of my voice, how I speak, what I do, how who I interact with? Everything about my life has to change in order to be considered a good one. But for white people, a lot of times it's a lot easier for you to get that gold star. But what are you getting gold star for? And when I want to talk about Malcolm, sorry, I, I don't mean to take so much time. When I talk about Malcolm X, it, it, and this first question makes me think about, um, and I, I apologize for not remembering this quote, but usually I, I'm pretty good on my quotes, it's about the knife in the back, right? Pulling out the knife a couple inches is not fixing things. That's not restorative. The knife is still there. But when you get a good gold star for the work, or you, you're the good white ally, and that knife is still buried in another human being, why would you even want that gold star? Why would you want that on your, why would you even say, I have a hard time accepting anything we do because it is a drop in, in a dry bucket, a steaming bucket. And for, for other people that's the same, like we get this. Sometimes it gets very frustrating because, you know, my blood, sweat, my tears, my life is, my life is both, you know, because of who I am is, is there and sorry got off on a tangent but you know um it's 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 harmful in so many different directions when when we don't have that that just kind of radical honesty towards ourselves towards each other and, and the way we approach the work thank you um <clears throat> sure um i think what comes to mind like <laughs> looking at the notes here is the relationship with land acknowledgements I, you know i started in this job about a year ago and i was like the big thing everybody is so proud that you know city council does a land acknowledgement now and you know in in like indigenous spaces we were all just like i freaking hate land acknowledgements it's so bad it's like you know but you'd have to sit there in these spaces and people are like oh land acknowledgement aren't you happy and and, and you know and i was talking to some people in a meeting i think it was just it ended up just happening to be a bunch of indigenous people in a meeting in some of these organizations and um, and I think there was like a couple of uh, European American folks in there, but we started just making fun of land acknowledgements, kind of you know the way we do in our culture. And I and I said to me, it feels like if you're growing up in a neighborhood and you know somebody steals like your uncle's car or something, and they're driving around the neighborhood in that car, and they're like, "Hey, thank you for you know letting me steal this car. It's freaking great." And like. And so you're just like, okay, cool. So, you know, you're reminded of this pain constantly and they're so happy and they're like driving around and like, oh, that's a great car. A guy stole it from his uncle. It's great. And you're like, that's cool. Why don't you just give it back? And like, I don't want to hear about, you know, how proud you are to, to do this little symbolic gesture and patting yourself on the back. And that's how it feels with land acknowledgements, you know, and it's, but I understand that it's hard because, you know, you look back at the uh, the situation with the native mascots, and and the problem is, is with you know liberal white supremacists will literally be like, well, I have a friend who's native, and native, they weren't offended, or you know, you're, it's like we're constantly asked to represent like an entire group of people, or uh, you know, growing up, my my friends and I, uh, you know, I'm mixed, my mom is black and my dad's indigenous, and we also have some European in us, but um. When it comes to, you know, people would find out what I was. They'd go, oh, what are you? What are you? All the time. And then when they find out that I'm indigenous, they're like, oh, my great grandma is like Cherokee. And so my friends and I always had these like code words and stuff. And we would we would start counting down after people would find out I'm indigenous. And we'd be like, five, four, three, two. And someone's always just like, yeah, I know. I got some Cherokee in my family. And it's like, you know, a lot of BIPOC people, we have these inside running jokes because we deal with this kind of, you know, the the nice racism all the time. And, and uh, so I'm just excited to, for that book, you know, <laughs> Dr. V's book. And it's just it's so validating and there's words to these, you know, there's names to these terms and situations now. So 
Yeah. <laughs> As the executive director of PJALS, um, education is a big part of your work and, and you work with a lot of white folks uh, who are members of PJALS. Um, can you share your observations about how this kind of, I want to be a good white person behavior could actually be harmful? Yeah, um, I think, I, I guess I'm echoing part of what Justice said, that when, when we engage in that behavior, what we're doing is participating in this false binary that says things like, all the racist white people live in Idaho, and then over here, magically across the state line, that's not us. Or all the racist white people live in the South, and here in the Northwest, we're fine. So it's an escape route from responsibility. It's a really false binary that um, really prevents critical thinking. And if, if falling off of the good cliff into the bad abyss is the consequences of making any mistake, it also impedes taking any kind of risk. So if we say the wrong thing, then we'll fall off the cliff and be bad. So the best thing is say nothing, do nothing, just don't participate. And that just allows the status quo to perpetuate. And it also really just ignores the reality that we all have this conditioning. We all are conditioned within white supremacy culture. There's no escape from that on this planet or the moon. <laughs> you know, it's like it's, it's here. So it's a really false picture of the world and we can't be solving problems or changing policies with a with an incorrect analysis at the base of it. Um, and so it allows exploitation and systemic racism to continue. And it makes us complicit in that because we're so ineffective when we're in that mode. And I, I also just wanna say that it's not, not um, stopping doing that is also not a binary. Like that is the default and we can slide into it just right back down the hill or sideways across the ice, you know, at, at it even, so even the good, bad binary is not exactly a binary. Um, no, no, I think that it's, that's, that's part of the goal for writing the book is that I, I, saw so many so much of this behavior and I think people really struggled like some of you have said to have a language around it or almost like a manual because there's so much emotional energy that we all have to put into like explaining and educating people on what they're doing and so if it was just like here just read this <laughs> you know if, if 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 I could give people something like a tool where if you're really committed then you have to do the work you have to um put in the labor to 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 read more, to learn more, to to take those steps um, to educate yourself and not expect like all your friends of color to exhaust themselves doing that for you. And like you say, because they're, you're not listening, you're just looking for the like, I'm the good one, right? Like that reassurance and then, and then moving on. Um, I mentioned earlier today about how like after the summer of 2020, a lot of the talks that I was asked to do was how to be an ally, how to be a better ally. Um, and so, you know, I was, I was happy to do that, but that's also why I put the piece in about like, there needs to be more space for people of color who, and, and accomplices who are true accomplices, right? Not people who are, um, just in it for the validation, but space to really organize and lift each other up and, um, help navigate some of these issues, um, if you are that my my the problem with all those talks on on how to be a better ally, it's like there's so much that question of what can we do, what can we do? Really, you could Google and find so many resources. If you Google how to be an ally, there's so many resources, so many lists. And so I I just felt frustrated oftentimes in those spaces of like, why are we wasting the time? And I'm giving you like some solutions and some active things you can do. And I just felt like they just many of those people who are just at that allyship level and hadn't like moved to being an accomplice, a collaborator, a co-conspirator that actually just in the language itself is more active, um, that I was constantly, you know, hitting that, that barrier. And, um, I actually wrote a, a work, a workbook that goes with this and, and it's uh, freely available online. And, and one of the things I, I talk about is like that, you know, that question keeps coming back of what can we do? And 
I don't know why um, people aren't hearing the, the, the ideas of what you can do. Like very simply, one thing is these are the things you shouldn't do, like cross them off, like stop doing these things because you are doing harm to people of color. It may be that it's just so, so overwhelming. It may be that it's just all new to someone or it's just like a strategic on some level, strategic response of not really want to engage in the work and, and showing just like a faux intellectual interest or, you know, desire into wanting to do these things. Um, I would say, you know, to practice being a good white folk, you shouldn't be looking for accreditation from BIPOC people. You need to go to your communities with your woke ideas and talk to your own people about your woke ideas and see see what it's like to be a BIPOC person having to struggle literally every moment, every community we are part of. But you go back to your community, to your potentially racist family members, and, and you explain to them why you believe what you believe. That'd be being a good white folk, in my opinion. But getting an accolade from me, looking for me for validation, you know, that's that's going backwards, you know. I don't I don't have the time or energy to validate anybody. I need to, you know, we got work to do. I, if I had like not only that color, but also class. Mm -hmm. the, the other, you could also maybe try to explain where they come from, like where people vote for a certain person. Maybe they are not just stupid. It, you know, they have valid reasons why they vote in a certain way. We, we really understand that, you know, they're, they're not a lost cause. They, they should also be understood. Like this idea that they're voting this way because they're racist. It just means to support for me. Like, why are they voting this way? Why are they really aligning themselves? Majority of people, for example, if I don't, I'm not really a politician. In 2008, a lot of these states who are voting red now voted for Obama. Why are they voting differently now? What happened? Yeah, I, I, I would know? like to uh, add to what um, Professor Kabidi said there. Because actually, you know, there were conversations that Liz and I had about the ineffectiveness of white allies, especially the white allies that who are more into virtual signaling. They're not really into changing their white peers' mind. This is about they themselves being woker than them. Um, so so that, you know, like we have a term, you know, for that kind of um um behaviors and uh, um, and I think one of the themes of uh, Dr. Beamer's book is about um, also the, you know, if they do take the intersectional approach that we want, but at the same time, they make it as an excuse not to focus on race. So kind of the dynamic is we, we need to address classism, but also make it not all about class. Um, and and PGILs have taken on the effort um, to run I think there are several rounds of Red Cross Academy now. Um, can you um, talk a little bit about that? <laughs> so um, we uh, at the Peace and Justice Action League launched a new program last year called BOLD, Building, Organizing, Leadership Development. And it's a, a leadership development approach to building the capacity to do organizing and movement building in Spokane County. Um, started uh, when I, I uh, learned a little bit about a book called Why Civil Resistance Works by Dr. Erica Chenoweth, and it's a quantitative study of violent and nonviolent regime change movements across the world in the 20th century. And one of her findings is that um, nonviolent movements have been twice as successful as violent movements, and, in, and specifically those that were most effective uh, if, uh, if there was a 2% population participation there was an 80% success rate. Um, with a 3% population participation, there's a 100% success rate. And so I was immediately thinking, how, what's 2% of the population of Spokane County? <laughs> because I think we need some regime change here. And um, so we started thinking about how can we really get to scale? And how we get to scale is through organizing. How we get to scale is by engaging more and more people. But we don't have enough hours in the day <laughs> to do that. So we need more people doing that engaging. So we recognize that Spokane County is really contested territory. We are really in struggle about who belongs and who is seen as worthy, who is supposed to be dangerous, who deserves to be safe. 
And um, those that struggle is all about race and class. And we're deeply conditioned to be silent about both of those topics. And so this program is about building the capacity and shared language to have hundreds and hundreds of conversations with strangers about race and class and politics. Um, so in order to prepare volunteers to do that, we uh, began our what we call our uh, Race Class Academy or Bold Academy, which is a five week series of workshops starting with curriculum from Dr. Uh, Ian Haney Lopez um, and now um, tailored by our wonderful facilitator team to be more um, locally based and more appropriate for folks who are not academics and um, you know who are getting into this. So the idea is that we build a shared analysis and a shared language to talk about the ways that we are pitted against each other and white people are paid off to support the overall system of class exploitation. And um, so we've had, we've done three rounds now, we're in the planning now for the fourth round, which will be in the spring. And we've learned a lot along the way. One thing we learned is that uh, folks, white people have to some extent received the message that we need to educate ourselves. Sometimes to the, to the, to the extent of kind of drowning out the message that we need to take action. And so folks were signing up it by the scores for the education part, but then not following through to do the canvassing organizing part. And in fact, in many cases seem to not even have a picture of what it looked like to talk to strangers in an organizing conversation. Their image of what it meant to be an activist was to argue really hard with the opposition on social media. And one of the principles of organizing is you don't actually spend that much time talking to your opposition. Who you want to talk to is the folks who haven't decided yet, who are not engaged on either either side of the spectrum, um, or folks who are on your end but inactive. So just that lack of class analysis, also lack of just kind of organizing analysis, were barriers that we really worked hard to try to address. I think another one is that a lot of folks were looking for kind of racism 101. Again, the kind of things that you can Google and really should have Googled. Our Bold Academy is not a 101. So in the latest session, we created a self-assessment quiz so that people could um, answer a series of questions and then assess whether or not they were ready for this. And if they weren't ready, we gave them a set of resources that they could go to, to watch, to read, to participate in workshops through the um, Greater Spokane Progress, Why Race Matters workshop. You know, there are resources in the community that are designed for the introductory piece, but not everything needs to be that. In fact, things do not need to all be introductory. We have to get to the 200 level and above in order to really you know, progress in learning and also to be more effective. So um, race, the Race Class and, uh, Academy is named after this really important research that lifts up what is a race class analysis. And the idea is that in order to understand the way that capitalism is a racialized structure, historically and currently, we have to use an analysis that can see race and can see class at the same time and recognize the ways that our country was formed through racialized capitalism, that it was not just incidental to capitalism, that there was racialized slavery and racialized land theft those were actually fundamental to the ways capitalism built this country, shapes our economy historically and currently. Thanks, that was really an important thing to say. Thank you. Um, um, and so I also want to um, have Robert and, and Justice talk about like your own experiences in terms of trying to take an intersectional approach in the you know, work that you're doing. Um, and, and the resistance that, that you get in terms of like how to address that racism evasiveness when you're trying to have that intersectional approach. Then which one of you want to go first? Mm -hmm. You think you have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulties. Um, it's, it's a huge can of worms. And I mean, just, you know, even hearing Liz talk about organizing and people not wanting to go door to door, I joke about being raised as Jehovah's Witness. And I'm like, I'm not knocking on doors anymore. <laughs> My mom had me doing that as a toddler. But um, 
you really do have to talk to people. And I think for me, over the years, um, you know, you're, you're constantly told you go to college. And uh, I think a lot of people wonder why I hate sports so much. And that's part of it, because I feel that, um, you know, growing up in the hood, you're told you either rap, play a sport or, you know, do something illegal. And like you go to college and it's like, oh, what sport are you here for? What scholarship did you get? And so like I straight up did not do sports for that reason. I hated it. Um, I literally only started playing rugby so I could like make fun of people who play football because like I didn't like bullies growing up. <laughs> so there's just a lot of that. Um, just being in those same conversations, you know, working in kitchens, working in manual labor, you know, just like there's definitely I, I would say class at times is more of an issue than race. Um, and that's what I was talking about earlier with, you know, it's, it's like the, the taboo topic, but like, especially in organized religion, you're going to see the like, this is how you should behave. This is how you be a good one, you know, when it comes to being black or this is how you're supposed to talk. And, um, you know, and then that there, there's just like that overlapping Venn diagram and then it plays into race. And like, it's just a whole cluster. It's so complicated. But in recent times, um, just kind of like what Liz is saying, you know, you come across people being like, oh, the Idaho, that's the bad, those are the bad ones, or, um, you know, talking about this, the the campaign for Measure One, um, talking to some conservative people, I had more interesting conversations because it was like, if you're talking to people you already agree with, you're just in an echo chamber and you're not really learning anything and you're not really teaching anyone anything, but to really be able to talk to people and just let them know, you know, they look at me and they're like, oh, you're a college educator or whatever. And it's just like, yeah, I used to drive a truck. Like I used to unload pallets of salt and like work eight hours a day on my feet. Like I've been through that as well. And you, and you almost have to just talk to people and talk about your experiences. Get out there and talk to people you don't agree with and learn something. Uh, it's it's uh, when it comes to race and racism and evasiveness though I'd say it, it's a hard one because you almost have to like pin someone down and like, <laughs> like trap them in a sense uh, you, know, you have to be like strategic to even have these conversations and, you know in, in, in these organizations especially it's like piecing everything together from everybody's situations and then trying to get them to just come forward and talk about it and that doesn't matter if it's, you know, you're talking to a European-American, a BIPOC person. It's just like, speak up about what harm is being caused. And then don't just like completely jump on somebody when they do cause harm. Like Talk about ways to just not do it again, you know, <laughs> or like, hey, you did this thing. It sucks. That didn't make me feel good. Don't do it next time. And then, you know, you just learn from it. It doesn't completely... Um, you know, discredit that person or you're not like the binary, you're a bad one, all of a sudden you caused harm because we're all causing harm. We've all caused harm. We're going to cause harm again. And so you want to just learn how to be better and just get back up again and keep going. That's how I see it. Um, I would say that, you know, when we approach people in, in conversation, when we, we try to talk about our ideas, we can't be like the street preachers. We can't come up and say, here's what I believe in. Here's all the details of what I believe in. Read on what I believe in. And if you don't believe what I believe, then I hate you. That's not the way we change the world. That's not how we build community. And that's not how we change ideas. And so when it comes down to accountability um, or for, for what people are going through, or you know what, um, it's consensual, right? You, you need to have, you can't force someone to be accountable if they're not able to understand like what it is that they're doing that's racist, right? A lot of people, a lot of white people freak out, you know, by the R word. Um, and so instead of, of, for me, it's hard because it's about a lot of understanding and it is, when we talk about the book and read the book, please read the book. It's really good. We talk about the emotional labor, like, you know, how do, we have to figure out how to navigate these very complex discussions. Otherwise, every meeting, we have somebody raising their hand and say, well, what about white people? Why did you not include them? We're, well, we're an organization called Spokane Community Against Racism, so we're highlighting some of you know, the systemic issues. But you know, that's always the question that's brought up. And I want to say to this room, I see you. 
whoever whoever feels the need, I see you. We understand. But and I understand when when we bring up other things that like you may not feel seen, but we need to have both understandings of each other, right? I want you to understand, like of course, in order to have a presentation and go in some kind of chronological order, we can't just massively go. Sorry. Anyways, um, so it's about yeah, just making sure we have those more human connections. We build community first, and then once we build community, then we don't have to pin anyone down. They're they're already stuck. And one thing that also I want to make sure we touch on, and some of you might have read it um, in the news, is about one of the recent um, Spokane City Council meeting. Um, I and I think this is a recent example of the tension that uh, we have seen quite often in Spokane and elsewhere. Uh, since Dr. Demon also addressed that, is is kind of the the debate, you know, or the tension between the liberal approach versus radical approach and oftentimes there is underlying racism and classism in terms of like what is appropriate um since just as you are the heart of that action um can you talk about like your personal experience with that um yeah so if you aren't aware already um uh, two mondays ago uh city council was shut down early um what we did was we read their words back to them. We were not allowed to say council member X said this on this date. Uh, council president Lori Kinnear would not allow those words to be said. And so we were getting called out for point of order. Um, and this was happening for a while. At first, we made fun of them by, you know, reading the rule in English and somebody reading the rule in Spanish and saying, like, you see how if it's difficult for you to understand this. So we we gave them chances, you know, we have lots of conversations with them, but overall there was an action taken basically where we defied the rules. I was the speaker in the end who was reading a transcript and please read the range article if you've read other articles, range covers it in great detail so you can really get the perspectives of, of why we did what we did. Um, but it was seen as civil disobedience, right? It was seen as an action that was uh, a little more radical, um, definitely, you know, City Council walked away from a meeting after hearing a transcript, um, which doesn't normally happen. Uh, there was a lot of cops there. And, but the main, the main sorry, what else, I won't talk about that, but that was kind of the, the outline. But before and after the actions, we see that when it comes down to the liberal approach, approach is meaning like more, let's do things within the realms of, of, of white niceness. and. I feel like I'm going through a lot of terminology that I need to cover. I don't know how educated everyone is in the audience um, on some of these. And I don't, I don't think anyone calls it white nice as such. I'm not as educated as Angie Beeman over here. But um, uh, the radical approach is saying, you know, when we fight for, for, well, at least the way I take it, when we fight for justice, sometimes the systems and sometimes the politeness needs to go out the window because we see that there's actual harm being done to people. If I notice that there's a knife in somebody's back, Maybe I'm not going to be slowly, politely asking for a band-aid, but yelling, you know, let's get this knife out, right? Um, and let's get some some care. Uh, so that's more like more. I feel like people get the other radical means. Um, but when it could, when I present these ideas, right? When I obviously I had to get more people in support. It can't just be myself. Um, a lot of the people I've worked with for a long time, um, they don't trust me. Right. Like I've been in this community. I've done a lot of radical action. But, you know, I come to you this idea, this idea I have vetted with lawyers, this idea that I've done a lot of work on, a lot of, you know, studying for it. Um, I'm not believed. I'm treated as if, you know, uh, often, you know, after well, this is after. And sorry, I'm getting a little emotional for sure. Um, as if I'm a punk. And I did come like when I was young. Like, barely like a decade ago, I was a punk. Like, y'all would not like me. <laughs> um, and it's hard to, you know, be labeled all that here in the news that, you know, um, you're being told like, oh, you're the, so disruptive. Lori Kinnear is still double or still saying like, you know, it was my fault and we would have disrupted the meeting anyway, even though you can see the action plan, you can see all these things, but that was never the idea, that was never the case. Um, but, you know, I get labeled as a brown person, you know, constantly as being disruptive or constantly not willing to work 
across the aisle, right? Why don't we want to work with our allies? Well, why are our allies saying this amount of things that are obviously problematic, um, but I'm often seen as the issue when it comes down to people I work with, um, people, you know, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at is even though we did the right thing, people said, well, you didn't do it in the nice way. What if that wasn't an option? Yeah, and I think there are things that uh, you all didn't hear about from the news articles that came out. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of this have been brewing for a long time because what justice has done was um, they have been mobilizing people to speak at um, the city council meeting and sometimes challenging our white liberal um, city council members. And so it is very interesting that it is the white liberal city council member who who got really upset about like disciplining folks and, and with the way that Lori Kinnear interprets um, the rule um, that is more about disruptive, uh, real disruptive if they are personal attack, but then they interpret it in a way that we cannot mention uh, any city council member by name, even if just stating factual information like reading a transcript, but it is something that ruined for a while. Um, and and so it's not like all of a sudden that is this radical approach. Um, and also what you all don't see is all the thoughts behind the action on that specific day, all the discussions that were taking place uh, behind the scene. Um, so I think kind of the idea of radical as spontaneous when radical can also mean thoughtful and well-organized, well-planned um, action. Um, I think Robert, also you've been experiencing some of this in your career. <laughs> On and off my whole life. But <laughs> I, I mean, I when I first started going to college, I was going to SOU years ago, back in like 2009 and uh, getting involved with some of those college organizations and I was seen as too radical. I mean, like we're sitting there in Medford and Ashland and we've got Nazis trying to beat people up and I'm like, let's fight back. Like, I'm not about to listen, we're just beating my ass like that. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't care what message you're trying to send. This is not how I was raised. And, uh, you know, I, I was starting to get like, look negative, you know, negatively upon in these spaces because you know there's like an accepted way you're supposed to behave and you're supposed to agree with us and then if you don't you know we're gonna like slowly push you out they're just too radical we're gonna you know and and um you know i was only even taking a, st a stance of self-defense and i mean when i was working in uh for my tribe uh, at a research station was when uh, the bundies took over the malher uh, wildlife refuge and I was working at our tribe's research station. We were about two and a half hours away from there. And we were getting death threats. We were getting, you know, we're, we're in a community where um, that location itself was about 45 minutes away from Klamath Falls in good weather, you know. But like, if it was snowing, it was about an hour and a half drive. The, and the police aren't going to respond because the police were part of that community there. You know, like they were supporting the agricultural community, people that were making death threats and like, so it's not like you choose to be radical. You're just kind of like, oh, am I going to just sit here and uh, get killed? And then, you know, they put my picture up on line for a few weeks and people hashtag me and then they forget about it. You know, and, and like, I got kids to feed. I can't. That's not me. I can't do that. I'm not going to sit there. I'm not a sitting duck. Um, and so I don't I don't think that some people understand that you, you don't make a choice to be radical out of, you know, you don't have that luxury. You're just trying to survive. And um, for me, you know, talking about with the justice, not jails, the pack, you know, that formed out of the, the smart justice Spokane executive committee and sitting in those meetings. Um, I think in Dr. Beeman's book, uh, the, uh, talking about asking the same questions all the time, that drove me insane, you know, sitting there every week after a week, how do we get more BIPOC people to the table? And I'm like, you know, my position as the network, um, you know, network manager is to talk to other organizations and talk to people in the community and find out how to get them to participate. And they're telling me, you know, I don't want to because of A, B, and C. So you come back to the meeting the next week, they're like, oh yeah, people don't want to because of this. And then people in charge are like, well, I don't think that's it. Let's, uh, let's figure out, let's figure out how to get these people. And like, literally after months we're watching like less people participate each week 
And then you're hearing the feedback of how these organizations are viewed here. And it's like the elephant in the room, but you can't talk about it. You don't want to hurt feelings. Um, and that was just driving me insane. And so, you know, I, I spoke up um, and, and Justice spoke up and others started to speak up. And that's kind of what I've just been telling people lately. Just speak up about what's bothering you um, because that that evasiveness and, uh, you know, people tone policing and being like, well, we got to be more calm about it is, is like what's causing this festering problem that everybody can see and name. But it's like, oh, if we just don't talk about it, maybe it'll go away. <laughs> And so, um, so yeah, it, it's just really frustrating. But at the same time, there is a time to be composed. There is a time to like wait and feel the situation out. And um, you know, like I was telling them all at dinner earlier, it's like they're both tools in a toolbox. You have to just know when to use them. Um, you know, there is a time to speak up, like Justice was saying, the knife's in somebody's back. There's no time to be like, excuse me, can you uh, twist that a little bit to the left for me? I mean, like. You, you know, so so there's it's yeah, it's just a balancing act, and it's something I personally am still trying to learn, and I know a lot of other people are wondering and trying to figure it out, but um, I don't think it's a binary. You know, one's better than the other. I think we should be talking more about when to use which approach, um, and not pitting them against each other. Uh, but that's just you know, it's just my opinion. <laughs> already a little bit over the official time and um i have more questions to ask but i think we should leave time for the audience but maybe before that um dr beeman do you have um something kind of to round up that kind of discussion i mean like speaking to your your last oh mm -hmm. speaking to your last point that's one of the key issues so so much of what you are talking about is is it's like the one of my case studies to the letter, like the the case study of there was liberals and this was white liberals and white radicals who um, were challenging the Board of Education because they agreed as Martin Luther King Jr. And this is like the interesting, like the liberals will sometimes trot out their heroes like Martin Luther King Jr., but it's a very sanitized version. And what his letter from Birmingham jail really described what was going on in this case study where the white liberals were saying, we agree with you radicals, with the, with this radical group in your goal, but not with your methods. And that is exactly what King said in his letter from Birmingham jail, that he's like, you know, he's, he's, he's more concerned about these white moderates who make that claim than some of the Ku Klux planners. Um, but that, uh, so they, they were trying to get rid of a corrupt superintendent, but it was always, the white liberals wanted to go about it using their methods of being nice and let's be civil and don't be mean to the board of ed. Don't tag them on social media because that's bullying. Um, and so, and, and so there was a, an interesting back and forth where the radical group would, would always say like hashtag tagging is not bullying. And, and there was so much going on with that, with the, the, but the use of respectability politics to shut um, the radicals down at the end of the day, those methods that the radical group was using achieved the goal. And the superintendent, they they got rid of this um, corrupt superintendent. And that's when the social media of the liberal group came on and said, we did it. We did like they took credit and uh, co-opted the work of the radicals. So seeing that pattern happen, happen again and again. And, and what I conclude with that um, is that there is a long history of that. I mean, you can look at the, the Black Panther Party and free breakfast programs and, and um, liberals seeing it that is like free breakfast, like that's a liberal program. That was a Black um, Panther program and they were, you know, seen as as radicals that was, was co-opted. Um, but I conclude that it's it's exactly what you say, that it's it's not, some of those methods are useful. It's not that, you know, using your um, public comment time and having the the school sanctioned walkouts, like even the students were, were more radical than some of the parents in, in, in challenging that and um, take, having petitions, all of those things are important, but the radical methods work too. And it's about combining them. But what what I would like to see, what we needed in the case of the Board of Ed, what we needed from the, the white liberals was um, not the shaming that, that came. Like if you don't want to be involved in those um, radical methods, it's fine. 
but don't shame them. Like there should be, you can be very strategic about it. Radical group is going to do this. Liberal group is, is doing this over here. But what was happening was that the liberals were openly shaming the radicals. And it's, it's, it's as simple as that is trying to, to find strategic ways to, to use these methods in, in connection with each other. Yeah, yes. we should open up to questions from the audience. Right. Yes, so um, the cover is a, a picture of Hate Has No Home Here. So this is part of a series on sociology of race and ethnicity. So they wanted to follow a very um, similar kind of design. Uh, but I talk in the book about how after um, when the high school students in my community were protesting and holding they holding up signs and they marched because of the murder of Eric Garner and they were holding up I can't breathe signs. It's like I didn't hear anything from the community about why are we not supporting these um, high school students? These are this is our community. And I was, you know, couldn't be part of the march, but I knew that students were coming by and I was picking up my daughters were um, in elementary school. So I was at the bus stop holding it to support them as they walk by. And like the parents are like, okay, <laughs> like, they don't want to be near me. One of them is like, do you live here? <laughs> like, yes, I'm picking up my daughter. You're the one who's being inappropriate. Um, but then summer of 2020, that's when I start seeing these signs hates or actually after Trump was elected. Kate has no home here, Black Lives Matter. And it was so it's it's like this it's it's a commentary on these these signs and how they were how they when they went up, when it was safe to do so, you know, um and 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 then also even how they were used in that case study, how the Board of Ed would say, you know, you guys are attacking us. You have these signs that say hate has no home here. But, you know, it doesn't feel that way because you're attacking us, which I, it, it was ridiculous because the signs that they were referring to at that time had to do with um, the deportation uh, of people of color and um, the, de the detention centers of immigrants. So for uh, a privileged white liberal on the Board of Ed to, to, to kind of make that comparison was really problematic. So that's why the sign. One question. <laughs> <laughs> With the uh, with policing in communities, over policing, over -policing. surveillance. <laughs> um. I know saltiness is fine. I think that's the problem. It's, you know, but I tell people like saltiness, just like with the taste, you know, that's all you kind of eat and everything kind of just sucks. Um, it's the same kind of thing with, with leftist infighting. I just continue to talk to a lot of young people about, hey, maybe we shouldn't take absolutist stances towards these organizations that have lots of people who may have different varying beliefs. Um, but how do you stop leftist infighting? It'll never stop. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that was a question, but that's kind of what I do in my approach. I do talk to a lot of, I'd say I'm definitely, I get called whatever, but I definitely stay on the left. Um, but yeah, I, I make sure that we just continue to have those conversations and continue to say, hey, are you taking an absolute stance towards people who should be your allies? And these are closer to be your allies than ever your enemies. <laughs> so, but. It's also hard to teach your allies since they think they know everything. I have a question. How do you define liberal white supremacy? Not define it yet. What do you how do you really define it? Well, I mean, I have that. I have a graph of yeah. all of the of, of all of the different behaviors, but it's it's a set of practices, behaviors, ideology of of that that helps to hold up white supremacy right so so some of those the white fragile behaviors can go into that that category the class elitism because it's if you are defining yourself as liberal if, and you define yourself as white and in the book i go into this detail about like what is problematic about the categories of whiteness and what whiteness actually is as a space of privilege and power and in ideology and that no person is actually a 
white person. And so there's just a whole history of that. But you define yourself as white, you define yourself as white um, and liberal, and you're exerting superiority. You're exerting supremacist behaviors, whether it is paternalism towards people of color, um, that virtue signaling and class elitism, um, asserting superiority as a white liberal over white radicals, then you are engaging in liberal white supremacy, right? If that makes sense. I it's, identifies liberal, you know, check, identifies white, check. Okay, you're engaging in supremacy behaviors. Um, in my book, I talk about there's there's a history of a hierarchy of race where that includes white people, right? So like there's a hierarchy of some whites were historically seen as better than other whites. We see the same kind of hierarchy being created by liberal white supremacists. It's not so much based on that biological category, but it's a moral kind of um, categorization of like I'm morally that self righteous. I'm morally better than the bad, badly behaving white white liberals or or, liber or liberals of color. I'm I'm better than the the Trumpist, right? So it's always reaching for those um, comparisons where uh, a, a person who identifies as liberal and white can see themselves as place them in the morally superior behavior a su superior position rather than really being justice centered. Time magazine, I think, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and At that, that time magazine, though, I, I remember there was a lot of um, criticism from racism scholars because it's like, so that's the future mixed race, but mixed race looked very European. <laughs> so like, I don't know what the fear was about, but, um, but yeah, so, so, so in the book, I talk about like when this with liberal and radical, I, I point out that it, it's really a continuum because there, and there are some people who in the radical group in the case study looking at the Board of Education, they were, some of them, like Michaela, who was really like using the most, I think, confrontational methods, she identified personally as a liberal. And I'd be like, mm, Michaela, you're a radical by my definition because of the way that I was defining it as um, the methods they use. So there's like, and, and then one of the people in the radical group was, most people just see him as conservative. He's one a person who says that he is fiscally conservative, but culturally liberal, right? So a lot of people just say, well, you're just conservative. But he and his, I categorized him the, in the radical group because of the methods he used, because it was confrontational methods. So there's, it's, it's a continuum and there's really like multi -time. I would say that you recognize that the absolutism that you recognize is wrong. So continue to make sure you don't practice absolutism. If you're taught it, then I'm learning. Uh, Jermaine, I don't know if we can just. <laughs> I think if Jermaine unmutes himself. Yeah, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and speak, Jermaine. All right, thank you kindly. This isn't this isn't connected to question or this direct topic. I want to make that clear, and thank you all for having me in space. This is uh, this is dating back. This is going back. Excuse me to. Uh, I have daddy brain right now, so please pardon me. My son, my newborn is three months old. I have daddy brain. Uh, this is going back to what uh, Justice was talking about 
previously. I was thinking about what Justice said initially about the attacks on their character uh, and, 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 and being labeled a radical and, and, and things of that nature, but I didn't state it after Justice has spoke because I wanted to just let it sit and kind of resonate with us a little bit. Uh, what I'm learning, and this isn't about letting people off the hook, not in any way, shape, form, or fashion. What I'm learning is that perspective makes a lot of difference, a heck of a lot of difference, right? And after Justice was 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 done talking about that, I was thinking about how, uh, just to paint a picture quickly, someone someone can step out of the house or out of their car, out on the town with a pristine white $10,000 uh, uh, Armani suit on, right? Just to paint a picture. Pristine white $10,000 Armani suit on, but it has a stain on it. It has a smudge mark on it, right? Many folks that I'm learning will not focus on the suit itself or what the suit looked like when you first got it or when you first put it on or even how much it's worth. What people focus on, most people, is the stain, right? Not where the stain came from, not like how long the stain has been there, any of that. So what I'm, I'm what I'm learning is that it seems that when people have the more information people have, the more informed the decision making process is, right? People are not going to take the opportunity most often in order to ask you or to ask me if I was the one wearing the suit. How did you get that stain on there? Oh. My son touched me, my son grabbed me, or I was in the process of changing him and, and, and something happened or what have you, right? Uh, because people will have a different perspective then once they find that out. So these people who oftentimes uh, use global labeling to label justice or any of the rest of us uh, as, 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 as radicals or otherwise, right? In some ways like to dismiss our activism or what it is that we actually stand for, what we stand upon and what we actually do. Again, when it comes to perspective taking, I'm starting to realize that the more information people have, the better informed their decision-making process is. And so, you know, for us, again, this isn't about excusing anyone else as I wrap this up. For us, for those of us who are uh, in the work, if you will, and, and, and we believe in the work and we stand on the work and our values, views and principles, uh, sometimes just taking perspective so that it doesn't keep us from doing what it is that we have committed to do, I think is sometimes the best course of action. While that does not change the impact that is left upon us and it does not lessen the blow or cushion the blow of what it is that we have to suffer from one moment to the next. Again, I think that perspective is 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 very, very important, especially for those of us in this work, because people are typically not going to apologize to us for the disparaging things that they say. So I just wanted to put that in space. Uh, and thank you for sharing that justice too, big time, and everybody else on the panel and everybody else in space, Zoom in in real time. Thank you. Thank you, Jermaine. Oh, so... There's a question from Brianna. Was writing the book and all the research you did healing, re-traumatizing both or something else? That's a great question. Um, I think it was both. Yeah, it, it was both. Um, sometimes, especially when I was writing about my own experience and, 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 and having to step back and because I was, I'm writing about some of the experiences with retaliation and with people who I thought uh, should know better, right? Like with, with academics who, who, who study or, or say that they study racism, who should, should know better about the things that they were saying about me, um, about the way that they tried to divide me in, in some of the people of color caucuses that I, I started. Um, that, that process was, that I went through. I mean, it really impacted me. It impacted my family. It impacted my children. Um, the way my children interacted with me because they saw what I was going through. So, um, and I was very angry about it too. And sometimes, as my colleagues will say the same thing, my co-conspirators, um, that I write the best writing I do is when I'm angry, <laughs> you know. And so, in that way, it it was healing to step back from it and write it and see what it was about. Um, to, to see that this was, it was made to, what, what they were doing was that they were really threatened. They were really threatened by me. They're threatened by you, people who are 
trying to say that you're disruptive, that you're too radical, that there's something wrong, or you're too much of this or too much of that, because there's something missing from them, right? It's not that you're too much. It's that there's they're too less in a way, or they feel that way, right? They feel that they're that they're they're missing something, and then and, and then there's a lot of projection. So being able to see that and say like, well, this is liberal white supremacy. What I'm experiencing this is a perfect case study, and so is healing. Writing about those experiences I had as a child, I think I've only, and that's just, it's pieced in here and there, but it's really just in the acknowledgements that I should have called it forward, you know, um, that's just like pieces of what happened to me when I was a child, what happened to my parents, um, my father, and that I think, there's a reason why there's only a little bit of that in the book, because I think it was re-traumatizing, and because in racism studies, what, what I was, um, when I finally got to the point where like, this is what I want to study. I want to study racism and I had mentors to do it. First of all, that field is really marginalized within academia. Maybe it's a little bit paid more attention to now. I think there has been some change, but it's marginalized. So it's hard to find mentors to do that. And then when I studied it, it was really from that black white dichotomy. So I was really understanding and learning about Malcolm X and feeling connected in some way, learning about Yuri Kochiyama much later because thinking through where Asian Americans fit within this, where working class people fit within this, so where my story fit, it took a long time to get to that point where I was able to even think about my own personal experiences. And so I think that it that part that part of it was really um, re-traumatizing and I'm still trying to get to that healing aspect of it. So thank you for that question. I think it might be almost time to wrap up, but I think one important thing I want to leave with everybody because um, you came here for a reason. Probably you want to learn or maybe even see where you could be part of the solution. So I think before we we go, I would like each of our panelists to talk about how people can, can engage. Uh, I would say Spokane Community Against Racism, we have a lot of social events. I would actually start there instead of as a volunteer. A lot of times groups want volunteers first. We want to know who you are, what you are interested in, what you care about, what you love. Um, and we can only learn that if you kind of hang out with us. So on uh, Wednesdays at uh, 12, we have a, a lunch meeting at Serenat Commons, uh, 9 a.m. every Sunday, same place, Serenat Commons. And then Tuesdays, there's a board game night. We're invited to all of those things. It's a great way to you know meet fellow community people and also engage and we have 10 rules of good conversation, but there's 11th rule, which is the fight. And so we do try to practice what's talked about in the book of constantly, if something comes up, we need to address it. Do you want to go? Um, so uh, we welcome folks to Peace and Justice Action League events. You can find our website at peacejustice.org. I have some a little few materials here. We are. We will be um, opening up uh, uh, registration for the next round of the Bold Academy and Bold Canvassing um, after the first of the year. And we have a number of committees, including the Showing Up for Racial Justice Committee, which has both a, a book club for um, re-education or education, as well as an action um, team that plans uh, benefits for uh, organizations based in BIPOC communities and um, our Peace and Justice Action Committee. But I also just want to invite you to our uh, winter party, which will be December 14th, and you can find information about that on the website. So uh, with Greater Spokane Progress, we're going to be coming out with a sign-on letter, uh, working on trying to uh, address the proposed city budget that's coming up. Uh, and on Monday, I think it's the second hearing at the city council meeting, so that's something that you know, if you can't be there to testify or, you know, share any of your stories, um, you could even write city council or do the sign-on letter. That's going to actually be really supportive of, um, you know, being able to fully fund that that new office um, and for them to hire people to actually get some of this work done. Um, and then beyond that, I just say the same thing I was telling people about that storytelling academy. It's like, you know, step out of your comfort zone and speak up when things are wrong. I know it sounds simple, but it, there's so much problems that are coming up because people are not speaking up or calling things out. And, um, you know, and if somebody calls you out, welcome it, like learn from it. Um, it's not the end of the world. We're all going to make mistakes. <laughs> we all make mistakes daily. So 
um, you know, don't take it as, as something personal. Uh, I think that's really hard, especially to call somebody out. It, it takes a lot of energy to even speak up. So, you know, if someone calls you out, just like appreciate it and learn from it. <laughs> We're talking about is the Office of Civil Rights, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, so we are we have been advocating for the creation of the office and to have full funding for the office. Uh, one easy way to find out more about why uh, we are doing that. Uh, there is an old pad that actually three of us uh, wrote that was published in um, this last Sunday's paper. So you can find out about that and and see what we are asking for. So thank you, Dr. B. Uh, you. and thank you for participating. We'll have probably we'll probably, probably like twenty five copies next month for the Starbucks Club. If you also want to join that. It's an occasional thing. We just buy a lot of books and then get people to read them. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah.